The following transmission contains unencrypted instances of explicit language. Mature audiences are cleared to proceed. All right, David, let me show you something. I wanted to show you this before you guys publish this episode. Now, I checked the audio files last night because none of this is making any sense. Now, I'm with you. Todd is going crazy with these comedy bits, but a bad podcast editor? I just can't get there. What do you have, Danny? If you're good enough to trust your audience that they found the podcast in the first place, then the comedy bit means nothing. Now, Todd would know that. Show me again. All right. Now, where you put the... Shall we begin? The 90s were not kind to James Bond. The granddaddy of all spy heroes was no longer feeling relevant or exciting to post-Cold War audiences. A new millennium deserves a new spy hero, and 2002's Born Identity paved the way for a literal reinvention of the action spy genre. I'm Todd. And I'm Dave, and we like to talk about spy movies. Supremacy just happens to be my personal favorite of the Bourne series, so that's going to be our launching point for discussing the impact of Jason Bourne on spy movie history in this episode of Spies Like Us. Now, you had seen you you you'd seen these movies, but you hadn't uh, gone out of your way to revisit them. That's is that about right? Yeah. I've I've seen the first and the second one. I don't think I've seen the third or the fourth or the fifth. I think we're on five now. Yeah, it's weird. There's, I mean, there's essentially there's the three that's like the trilogy that really stand up, and then there's one that with with Jeremy Renner they tried to reboot that everyone disliked. I remember kind of liking it, but also I really don't remember it. So I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and then the fifth one they tried to bring. Uh, Matt Damon back, and also nobody liked that one too. I, that's the only one I haven't seen, and uh, that one I felt like I was cool with jumping on. I wanted to give Jeremy Renner like a good like chance, you know. So I felt like optimistic about it, and I came in with like uh, a basic like forgiveness, a forgiving kind of point of view. You know what I mean? Like like where I'm telling myself like, okay, like don't expect this to be as good as Matt Damon. But give him a chance, because maybe he could grow into it. Right, but, right. But when they come back and decide, like, oh, let's try and drag Matt Damon back into it, then I'm just kind of like, nah, I'm not even really interested in that. Because I, because if if the Renner ones turned out to be shitty, I still feel like it doesn't lose anything. But if I watch the 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 one where they brought Matt Damon back and that's shitty, then I feel like it'll detract from my appreciation of the trilogy. Right. So I just kind of don't want it. Maybe I'll watch it someday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so 2002 is when Born Identity comes out. And I want to talk about that a bit. Because 2002 uh, and, and this whole era is like an interesting one, I think, to talk about in the action spy movie genre. In fact, I think it's kind of like a, a time when it's being reinvented, seriously. Uh-huh. At this point, the James Bond fr- franchise, the long-running James Bond franchise, is in real trouble. It's in the worst spot that it's it's been since the beginning with critics and audiences. Um, Pierce Brosnan, his first one, uh, apparently people generally liked, you know, was cool or whatever, but it's just not working out. He's He's had like three, like just absolute failures in a row. Um, and, and I, I think it's interesting, just a little side note to throw out that it's in 1997 is when, uh, the bond ship really starts sinking fast. You know, what came out in 97, what Austin powers. Oh, really? (laughs) That must've killed bond quite a bit. I like to think so, because my thinking goes that after seeing Austin powers, it's really hard to look at Bond and and not see how well the ways that in which he is stupid. I don't want to say how stupid he is, but you know all the silliness of it. Yeah. 
Um, it's, it, it, it's they definitely played on all the Bond tropes. So that, like that whole movie is just playing on Bond tropes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But yeah, I, I feel like there has to be a connection there with with Austin Powers pricking such a big hole in that balloon that that just all the air fell out of it. Yeah. <laughs> now. In 1996, we had had Mission Impossible 1, which I think, I feel like is a little bit of a, not quite getting there to the modern action spy genre. Uh Um, Even though, I mean, you can't deny that that end scene with the, like in the tunnel with the helicopter, Mm -hmm. that was definitely like some super high octane shit that we had not uh, seen before in, in spy action movies. MI2 comes out in uh, zero, 00. It comes out in 2000. And MI2, you can say what you want about it. It's the most hated of the Mission Impossibles. I just, I like it for personal reasons. I, I like, <laughs> I like dumb Verhoeven-esque kind of comic book-y uh, movies. And, and I thought that one really felt like a, a comic book. But the thing is, like, Mission Impossible 2 really does like crank up the mm, the spy action sequences up to a to a really high really high pitch. I mean, you got John Woo energy there. Yeah. And I think that even if people didn't like that movie so much, I think it's indisputable that uh everything that's come after including uh the Bourne stuff that we're going to talk about um we're kind of had at least taken note of MI2. Uh, to be honest, I don't think I ever saw it. Uh, I, oh, really? I, I saw the first one. I liked the first one a lot, but I definitely saw the third one because Philip Seymour Hoffman is not somebody you really want to miss. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know that's your pick for our for our first uh, Mission Impossible movie when we get around to doing that one. Yeah, that, that's that's going to be fun. After you get the Bourne movies, at least the first two, I think they're drawing off of this new energy that's that's coming out, this this kind of anti-Bond and, and more action and more, uh, I don't want to say necessarily believable action, but more palpable and, I don't know, grounded action does that well, make I think sense it, i think it is more believable not that it is like you know super realistic but i mean a lot of it isn't like ridiculous like like it, it it's something that i guess could happen you know it's just not likely versus like a lot of the bond stuff you're just like oh my god like <laughs> think think about like what die hard did to the action genre in general you know like yeah. the die hard is the movie where we really really got behind a hero that felt punched in the face, like when he yeah. got punched in the face, like you yeah. felt it. Yeah, <laughs> it was it, it was gritty. Worried about him, he felt he felt uh, I don't not fragile, but definitely not untouchable. Right, right. You know, and the like all the action is felt. That's what I'm talking about. Like even if you know the Mission Impossible movies and and some of the stuff in Born, like and and in the new Bond movies, it. It's kind of flights of fancy, like this could never really happen. Nobody's that good, but it's still it's just gritty in a way that old Bond never was. Right. But out of Jason Bourne, Daniel Craig Bond, and Ethan Hunt, do you have a favorite? Um, I really enjoyed the Daniel Craig Bond films. Uh, I, I, I'm not gonna say like. Like I'm putting them on my top list for spy movies, but it was definitely a big shift from old Bond. Like I remember, you know, like I think we talked about this where, you know, like the Pierce Brosnan Bonds weren't like spectacular, but you know, Goldeneye, the video game came out from it. So that was something to think about. But after the second one of the Brosnan ones, I was like, what is going on? Like, you know, like it, it wasn't really appealing to me. So when the Daniel Craig one came out and everybody was like, you know, going nuts about it and I saw it, I, I was kind of really surprised. Uh, so I, 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 but I don't know. I, I kind of like the born statement, 
you know, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about Matt Damon's uh, thoughts on the born, I guess, um, uh, pathos is what you would call it. Uh, so I, I, I really like that about the born films. Right. Um, and the Daniel and the Daniel Craig, I think the Daniel Craig movies, they can't exist unless Bourne had come along and shown the way to a better bond. Right. Bourne gave us a better bond for sure. I, I definitely would agree with that. It's like, it's like, it's like Austin Powers fired the headshot and, and Jason Bourne like buried the corpse. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, so yeah, yeah, no, no, no favorite. You would you go with Daniel Craig though out of these three? Because I think these are. Oh no, I probably would go with Bourne. I mean, I uh, think these from days... a more from a more pathos level, or I guess an ethos level. You know, it's it's uh, um, it, it, you know, we're gonna talk more about uh, some people's thoughts. You know, from the artistic, figurative, metaphoric standpoint of the Bourne films, I really liked what Matt Damon had to say about it. And and I agree. And I think that's what I would draw more towards as what America really wanted to be and where we are now um, versus, uh, you know, something like a bond, even though the Daniel Craig bonds really did, you know, step up to the plate and, you know, match the bars that had been raised uh, just you, you could never get rid of that like classy, uh, upper you know, upper scale uh, image of Bond. He always has to be, you know, that dude that like goes on extravagant like missions and like you know drinks nice cocktails with hot ladies. You know, it's that's you're it never going to get it, away from that. It always feels like that's baked into the cake that Bond doesn't really take the shit seriously. Old Bond, I mean. Yeah, but what what I'm saying is, is even though D- the Daniel Craig Bonds did like match the current bars at the time, uh, you can't you can't ignore who Bond is supposed to be, and so that that image of just like high high society is always going to be that you can never get rid of that. You can never make a Bond film where it's like like you get like a Born or something like that, where you you get something more grittier and. And, you know, it also has to do with, like, you know, British versus American values and cultures, I guess. Um, you know, so that, that that character cannot leave those particular... Like, even though they might have gotten rid of a lot of the sleazeball, like, like uh, sexual harassing bond, he's still going to be a playboy. You know, he's still going to go to some really, like, high-end places. So, to me, like, I don't really appreciate that type of a uh i guess spy master or whatever versus like a born represents you know uh, i think i want to i want to throw the word privilege in here to describe what i'm hearing from you uh as as far as the comparison like uh born doesn't feel like he uh you know went i mean went to the best school <laughs> no but he got the best training and the best like right like injections and body enhancements or whatever like it was kind of just handed to him but like what's different with bond i think bond wanted to be a spy and wanted that life and born was just kind of thrown into it and i and i i, th- I think figuratively speaking I, I don't know maybe we should just talk about you know matt damon's thoughts now like it, it, I really liked his point about, you know, uh, Born represents what America wanted to be and, you know, kind of the story is where we are now. And and I, I think that's really what Born represents is, you know, this like uh, this old memory of what America was intended to be versus like uh, this like corporate uh, – machine of bureaucracy that has a life of its own kind of like policing the world you know like like the the, the american idea was like standing up for what's right you know you know and, th- and this reflected throughout the decades uh you know until like certain people started getting control and like certain machines started happening and then you have the intelligence community and now it's it now it's just, just kind of like I don't know, this corporate hive, you know, uh, not, not that I'm like, you know, and don't get me wrong. Like, especially if anybody's, uh, listening from, from 
team uh yay uh matt damon's thoughts on born specifically was like america used to stand for something now we're just kind of this like machine like this giant kind of like this like like unbridled corporate i guess type of you know and and this is this is i think highly re- reflected in the born films and and that's why i kind of would go more for born because he's just kind of like like especially in this movie the whole the whole point is like he 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 just wanted to be left alone like he was just like you know after after the born identity everything's kind of settled treadstone's kind of like made obsolete or gotten rid of quote unquote or whatever and and he's just living out first of all he's hiding out he's going through nightmares every night panicking all the time you know, and and uh, terrified somebody's gonna like be showing up on his doorstep, and they do, and it, and it's just like he just wanted to live his life and be left alone, and and here comes the big machine and the past of what this machine had created out of him and made him do in his past is going after him when he's he's walking away from it. You know, he's not going to go out and tell on anybody. He's keeping his mouth shut. He's just living with his, you know, his, I don't know if they're married, but like, you know, his, his main squeeze or whatever, you know, they're very much in love and she's very supportive and, you know, he's, he's there, you know, like they have a nice life, you know, even though he's like kind of like looking over his shoulder all the time, but you know, it's that's what it was. He he's the guy that was just like, just leave me alone, let me live my life and do my thing. And they, now that now now all this stuff like other people that have to cover up their mistakes are coming after him, and he and he loses like the love of his life like because of it. And 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 that's the main like you know spark that kind of sets off like you know his John Wick moment, I guess. <laughs> like it's the pre <laughs> it's the it's the it's the pre John Wick you know storyline, I guess. Where like. You fucked with me, now I'm coming to get you, you know. You know, not that it's like an original story, but like that's the basic premise. It's like, you know, like he, he's just trying to like, you know, build a life, you know. It, it, you know, I, so I think I think I think I like Born the most. As far as action goes, I would still say that much because you know, the MI the Mission Impossible movies are just like over the top ridiculous. Versus Born, it, like I said, is much more realistic. Like it's it's much more believable, even though it's 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 highly unlikely that someone could like pull off all this stuff. But like you know, that's part of the action movie, you know. So I like that they made it more realistic, but it's still a little bit like kind of more, I guess, imaginative of what could be pulled off, you know. Right, and that it feels visceral, and it feels like like the stakes are. Are really there and the Abs- fights feel, absolutely like the fights feel losable the car chase never feels like like i don't know i don't know it just i don't ah, it's it's hard to describe visceral is just uh where i'll where i'll go there but i want to i want to crowbar my way in here yeah, sorry i'm sorry <laughs> that's cool um i really 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 like born and i really like new bond and i really like ethan hunt I like them all for different reasons, but the reason Born is my favorite of them, I think, comes down to this relatability thing. Even though, you know, like, you know, how relatable can you make a, a super soldier? I think, you know, the out of the three, Born is easily the most relatable. You know, he 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 feels he feels. Uh, human and and lost in a way that Ethan Hunt and James Bond never do. Although James Bond does a really good job, new James Bond does a really good job of changing that thing where, you know, it used to feel like, uh, you know, Bond was never accountable. He never made a decision that he regretted, ever. Oh, okay. Right? In yeah. all the iterations, but now yeah. Daniel Craig actually has some some inner life and some inner doubt. Uh, which is cool, but here's the thing too. Keep in mind that the Bond movies, again, they were designed as a franchise. Remember, the reason we got Sean Connery was because they wanted to sign a five-picture deal with with a with a an actor, and they wanted um, what's his name from North by Northwest. They wanted Cary Grant, 
Yeah. He, he wouldn't sign for five films. Sean Connery didn't have as much clout. He didn't have as much of a resume under his belt. That's really hard to imagine these days. Yeah. Like a, a Sean Connery that is looking around in Hollywood and saying like, <laughs> saying like, well, I guess, I guess I got it. I got to eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the the what I want to draw in there because I mean they come out with these movies and they're boom 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 sixty one sixty two sixty three I think they skipped sixty four but then there's another one in sixty five it was always meant to be a franchise and run for as long as it could and has but and the the Mission Impossible movies obviously like they didn't quite they didn't necessarily have franchise in mind when they made MI one but they they got to that point. Um, Born was was first of all like they had no plans of making a second movie. And I think this is important. Like, there's only so many movies you can make with a complex character before it, he becomes a like a parody of himself. And yeah. I think also I think Daniel Craig. I mean, I hear that like, like the main reason he wants out is because he's just tired. Like the just the stunt work, he just thinks it's just too fucking demanding. No, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and is just getting pissed <laughs> off about being thrown off of boats and punched <laughs> in the yeah. and and having. I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure they didn't actually fucking smash his balls, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah. from Casino Royale, like. He just doesn't enjoy that kind of shit the way that Tom Cruise does. Like Tom oh. Cruise, Tom Cruise lives for that shit. Yeah, that's what he's all about. So he's he's predestined to be in that kind of thing. But Born, I always think, and that comes back to also why I'm not that interested in the fifth one. Even if I don't know if I, even if it had been good, I think it still sucks something away. There's something tight about this trilogy. You know, it's a, it's a story with a beginning and an end. Yeah. So so about that, the um, like I said, the first one they made, they they didn't have any plans to make a second one. Uh, a, a quote from Matt Damon was, uh, you know, when when Identity came out, uh, he said he thought there was extremely low chance that they were going to make a second one because nobody wanted to make a second one unless it could be as good as the first, and nobody really believed that they could make it as good as the first. Yeah. And then they said that too about the second one. They didn't want to do a third one for the same reason. And I, I love that commitment of Matt Damon to the to the quality of the product, and apparently everyone else involved. And I think Daniel Craig is also feeling some of that too. You know, he feels like there's a point at which I could overstay my welcome here, and uh, kind of the the life of of the character will start to. You know, just turn from someone that audiences care about into just kind of a a, a parody, a caricature, which mm -hmm. which the Ethan Hunt character will never suffer from because he's all, he's just all action. He's just all action. Yeah. No, just nobody, put, nobody, nobody put, gives a fuck about Ethan Hunt's inner life. No, no, but, it's always pushing the envelope, like uh, <clears throat> chasing ch chasing that rush, you know. But when they did get around to making a second movie uh i think that i think i can tell exactly where they the the people the new people they brought in and the script writer got his energy and it's from that quote uh you alluded to this a bit earlier but uh you know the quote from the first one where he says i swear to god if i even feel somebody behind me there's no measure to how fast and how far how Fart? Did I say fart? Yeah. And how? <laughs> how... <laughs> There's no measure to how fast and how gassy I will be. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how hard I will bring this fight to your doorstep. And he, that line just seems to be like the entire seed of supremacy because he did feel someone breathing down his neck and he did bring the ruckus. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The... So, like, the first one is, like, it's kind of only loosely based on the book. Like, they kind of, like, took the character, but then kind of made their own story. So even though it is a trilogy, and they use the names from the trilogy of the books, uh, you know, all that shit happens in, like, the 70s. It's, like, right after Vietnam. Uh, it's It's got no real, like, geopolitical connection to the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. 
And so with the second one, they really, really said, uh, we're just going to depart entirely from the books. You can find maybe some characters that kind of share a name or something, you know, like Treadstone's mentioned. There is a guy named Abbott, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it really just doesn't, doesn't track along with the novels. And what they wanted to do here was uh, kind of send Matt Damon on a um, an almost like samurai-esque quest for um, uh, atonement. I, I love I love Matt Damon's acting in this role. I think he's I think again I said before in Good Shepherd. I think my favorite thing that Matt Damon does, the times when I love Matt Damon the most, is when he is showing so little of what's going on in his heart, but you can just tell that it's there. Yeah, no, like uh, he definitely has a lot of like small subtle emotional displays that makes him like really cool for these type of roles right and there's only one moment in this movie where he loses it when when he's interrogating nikki um and i don't even know if he actually lost it he might have just been doing some of that verbal judo you know command stuff he probably was trained like display like to get it out of her i personally like to think that that's our little peak into what's really like bubbling underneath the surface. Yeah. Um, but that his training is what's keeping all of that in check for most of the time. Franca Potente, the uh, German chick, she, uh, it's kind of, I don't know. I really, I remember the first time I saw this movie, I was really pretty sad and disappointed that they offed her. Yeah. Really early because. Uh, I was a big fan of her breakout film, Run to Lola Run. And uh, I, I was just like super jazzed to see more of her. Um, but the more I've seen the movie, the more I realize like it, it absolutely just has to be that way. Has to be that way. Yeah. And please, anyone listening, if you haven't seen Run Lola Run, please see that movie. It's a, tr- <laughs> it's a tremendously fun and kinetic indie movie that plays around with time in a in a weird way and it's it's just it's just cool brian cox caught this little nugget from uh trivia probably from imdb trivia he appears in two other movies as the employer of an assassin who has amnesia after a traumatic event <laughs> <laughs> the other two movies are uh the long kiss good night from 96 oh you never saw that with gina davis no is it good uh- yeah, it is. It's really good. Should it should it be on our list? I don't remember because I saw it when it came out, so I don't know how much tradecraft there is, but I would presume so because it, it, from my memory of how it felt, it kind of felt like a movie that should be on our list. Well, I'm definitely going to check it out because I'm all about Brian Cox and I'm super all about Gina Davis. And then the other one where apparently he uh, played this uh, part was uh, – X2 X-Men United in 2003 which I probably won't run out to see <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I did see that but don't remember much of it <laughs> yeah most a lot of the X-Men movies have not really uh, floated my boat the way I would like them to yeah and uh, uh, Carl Urban I remember, like, I remember when Carl Urban first got cast as Dr. McCoy. That really tripped me out because, first of all, McCoy is my favorite of of the three main guys in classic Star Trek. Uh huh. That's that's my guy. Uh, and but I was like, what the fuck? And I literally said, like, Carl Urban's not an actor. He's a mini boss. <laughs> <laughs> because I was thinking of. Movies like Doom and this movie and Riddick and to some extent like uh, he he shows up as the the horse lord in in Lord of the Rings, but uh, he's he's just is always like never the head villain. He's always like the guy that you need to beat up before you can get to the head villain. He's a great McCoy too. That's what blew me away. Was like I I absolutely I couldn't see how. 
this guy could possibly be McCoy. All I've seen him is do shit like up until that point, all I'd seen him do was this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, th- I thought he, I thought he delivered and was a satisfac, very much more than satisfactory McCoy. I thought he was great. That whole cast was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, last thing to talk about about this movie, just in, uh, you know, the historic, you know, uh, of the uh, placing it in the setting of other films and in film history and the advancement of the art is uh, we got to take some quick notes on shaky cam. And uh, if you go to, uh, you know, you know what Shaky Cam is, right? Of course. Yeah. What was that movie, Cloverfield or whatever? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. You can see uh, the or Blair Wiki. Witch. Blair Witch, yeah. I think, first yeah. did the like, Shaky Cam. Blair Witch yeah. is a good one. Uh, Cloverfield. That if in the wiki on Shaky Cam, they actually use a the picture they use is of a notice pasted on the theater doorway, uh, warning audience members that you know some people watching this film may experience uh motion sickness and and other effects associated with uh and nausea uh, associated with uh riding a roller coaster <laughs> wow <laughs> um but uh in that wiki when they when they get down to the part where they talk about like criti- uh criticism of shaky cam they uh-huh. actually use uh the the second the barn supremacy is their example that they use of uh, movies that were criticized for excessive shaky cam technique. Oh, huh. I didn't even notice. <laughs> well, you're younger and you grew up with this shit. Yeah, you know? that's true. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I think it's a, I think it's definitely an age thing of like I think like. You know, this is the kind of movie, for example, like where I, I couldn't possibly show it to my grandmother, Dottie. Oh, uh, you know, okay. Yeah. She was still with us. Um, or any movie that is that moves around this much. I, I accidentally made the mistake of taking her to see uh, Doctor Strange. Oh, yeah. There's lots of lights and shaky stuff. And it, yeah, and there I'm not so much talking about the. Sh- I don't think it was the shaky cam that threw her off so much. Now, keep in mind, she had seen several like Mission Impossible type movies with me and uh-huh. several Marvel Avengers type movies and really liked them. Oh, okay. But she came out of Doctor Strange just with the just the most like fuck that shit. <laughs> like attitude. And I think it was just the excessive amount of uh CGI and everything shifting and changing. And I think just like on a just on a generational level, like her brain is just not trained to process Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. There's a lot of like quick cuts too, and a lot of this stuff too, like comes out of like uh, the quick cut thing comes out of the MTV effect. Mm -hmm. You know, like like MTV music videos, they they involve like so many just short like just show you something for like. 0.5 0.5 seconds or 0.25 seconds flash over to this then show this and cutting back and forth and and stuff it's right it's definitely here to stay yeah for sure it's used all over the place you ready to go into the briefing room and start talking about the plot and the tradecraft is within absolutely all right let's go This story has got uh, kind of sort of a not exactly a detective movie structure, but it's similar in that there's a core event that occurred that if everyone knew about that, then we, you know, from the get go, we wouldn't have a movie. Everyone's trying to like dive in and peel away like the layers of the onion to get to, to the core. There was a theft of twenty million dollars that uh, Brian Cox's character and our character uh, Gretkov cooperated in. It was about seven years ago. Twenty million dollars of CIA funds like just disappeared uh, during a wire transfer to Moscow, of all places. Uh, right. So in the timeline of this movie, that would be ninety-seven. Yeah, that's true, and that gets my that gets my uh, I'm roaring out of the gate with my top worst tradecraft number three. 
Uh, minus spy points for routing $20 million of CIA money through Moscow in 1997. I can't get there. No, I, I mean, there, there's an article that we found on the CIA website that uh, shows some of their, uh, I guess, priorities in Russia was like on the top of the list for their hard target. It was like Russia, China, Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. We've never gotten friendly enough. <laughs> there's yeah. no there's no point <laughs> since World War II that we've gotten friendly enough with Russia that I would feel comfortable routing 20. Why? Why? I, it's it's silly. I, I I can't figure that out either. We'll just take we'll just take it as written. Got yeah. plenty of other fish to fry, but I I had to flag this one. It doesn't scan. But um, our uh, wait, 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 I think she was the deputy director. Landy confirms that uh, it's pretty obvious one of their own had taken the twenty million. Um, during this point, there was a uh, I guess a diplomat Nesky. To he, he stepped forward to let. Uh, the CIA know what had happened um, and uh, met his untimely death. I guess uh, the people uh, who had been involved in that theft needed to get rid of him. And as we find out later, we know it was Bourne who uh, committed that murder uh, or I guess that assassination or whatever. I think you're right that if everybody or even anybody other than Abbott, who's a, Cox's character knew this event had taken place. We really wouldn't have had a movie. Right. So it was Brian Cox who had been involved in stealing the money that ordered uh, Conklin, who was like, uh, I don't know, Brian Cox is overseeing Treadstone, but Conklin, played by Chris Cooper in the first movie, is the one that was like doing the, the actual, like, I don't know, I guess day to day kind of stuff. Well, I mean, from what I remember of the first movie, he seemed more like a handler to these guys. Uh, sure. That, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so, yeah. you know, because when he finally meets Bourne in the first one, he was like, you were a $20 million weapon, blah, blah, blah. What happened to you? Like, you, you didn't complete your mission, you know, because he's going through amnesia. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and so, like, uh, Conklin's kind of his supervisor. So I presume he's like a handler at that point. Uh, but... The, the the second onion layer is uh, during this you know uh, murder of Nesky. Nesky's wife was there, and so he he had to uh, kill her in, in in the moment. He being and Jason Bourne. Jason Bourne, and this happened to be like his first like kill that he was assigned to. And this is the one. You know, this is the event that he doesn't quite remember ish. Like, and these are kind of the events that he's seeing in his dreams when he was living with Marie and throughout the film, we're getting quick flashbacks of this. Right. It seems to be the part that's troubling him the most. That's like the part of his subconsciously, I don't know, eliminated memories. That's trying to fight through the amnesia and and get to him. Right. So it's, so like the onion layer one, the theft of the 20 million, that's Pamela Landy's goal. That's where she wins wins the plot. You know, if this is all, like, I like thinking of it as a game, like, you know, what are the different people after? What constitutes a victory for them? For her, a victory is finding out about the theft of the 20 million. But Onion Layer 2 is where Bourne wins the movie. He's trying to get to this truth. That's his personal quest. Onion Layer 3 is, well, actually, 4 is <laughs> how they get tied together. But 3 is where... <laughs> You know, the outer layer is, is in in 2004, so now when the movie's taking place, uh, Pamela Landy is leading a CIA team to an unnamed Russian source to find out what happened back in 1997. Her operation to get the information from the Russian source is interrupted by Carl Urban, who's working for uh, Gretkov, who, again, was the guy that collaborated with Brian Cox to right. steal the money in the first place. Right. Uh, Carl Urban's going to get sent in there to uh, not only stop them from getting the information, but also to put them onto uh, Jason Bourne as diversion, a different rabbit to chase. Right. 
Carl Urban, by the way, he works for the Federal Security Service, which uh, that's a direct descendant of, that's the most direct descendant of the KGB. That's the one that, like, basically they all work in the exact same offices at the exact same desks, even though the KGB is, like, officially non-existent anymore. Uh, it's just still going on under a different name. And I only got FSB from the wiki. I don't think they ever mention in the movie Right. Uh, uh, what Carl Urban's particular, uh, I don't know, uh, job is, except that he's a murderer for hire that works for an oligarch. Well, but... he does. He does scream out that he works for that he's Secret Service when the police stop him and they had to get his badge out. What was that part? When um, Bourne's in Russia and he's and running down like a, I guess you know one of those like hike paths next to a river and then. Urban's like on top of a bridge and takes a shot at, at Bourne in the shoulder. Uh, and then the police show up because he's basically pulled out a gun and starts firing <laughs> out in public. And he's just like, I'm Secret Service, I'm Secret Service. So that's okay. probably where that comes it comes from. Excellent, excellent. Carl Urban could be um, working for Gretkov in an official capacity, or he could just be making some money on the side. Right. Which is kind of what it like seems like. Uh, I I don't know because like the when he meets Gretkov and Gretkov, he's like I thought I had a month off and he's like well you told me Bourne was dead, you know. Uh, it, it I don't know and it looks like this money changed at some point. I don't know. Right, that implies the official <laughs> capacity thing. But in that case, why are you paying the guy in like big stacks of hundred dollar bills right it's, instead of just you know <laughs> instead of just you do this job because that's your job and you're getting a salary for doing your job right <laughs> but uh his job here his his mission is to uh stop pamela landy from getting the information still right. three million while you're at it hey why right. not yeah uh and then uh frame born and then kill born he does everything well up until the last thing, his last little bit of, of job. Uh, he fucks up because he accidentally kills Marie in a missed shot on Bourne, accidentally thinking that he did manage to kill Bourne, which puts Bourne in play. And so now Landy knows about Bourne. She starts following up on that end. And now so we have, like, uh, both of our... Mm, two protagonist sides, you know, cause, cause Landy's a protagonist, right? Right. Or, or I guess, I mean, we're, we're, we're rooting for her. Right. Uh, we're, she's, we're she's, she's support. doing her, she's doing her duty as, you know, deputy director and following through all the leads to, you know, to, like you had said, it's a detective story. She, she's doing her due diligence and it seems like she's a, an a agent of, um, uh, integrity type of thing, you know, and what's, what's really great about this setup is that these, these two, I guess, protagonists, as you describe them are going after each other, but in, in the process of doing that, they're both slowly finding the truth because when Bourne figures out who is the main contact on CA a side he's led to her so he's chasing after her for information and when landy is digging into um this murder and the murder in 97 and who stole the money uh she's she's being pointed back more and more to born because born was framed so it's kind of like a candle burning at both ends for uh abbott which is played by cox it's fun seeing like two you know people that we were rooting for uh, going after each other, and we're getting just enough information for us to be like intrigued as the audience. Of of we know that something's wrong here. Something smells super fishy, but we don't exactly know what. All we know is that we're seeing two people that both seem to have good intentions going at each other, locking horns, trying right. to eliminate the other. Right. Um. But but we can tell that there's some kind of mis basic misunderstanding here between them. And I wish I wish more spy movies had that element. It's 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 good. It's solid. It's fun. But you know, as we all know, pretty much from the beginning, you know, it's not hard to figure out that Brian Cox is like the villain the whole time. 
Um, we just don't know how he's involved with it. If you, you know, skipped identity or if it had been years and you hadn't really remembered, then maybe you didn't catch on that Brian Cox is definitely hiding something. But if you, for instance, came into this movie fresh from identity, he's, he's walking around with a huge red flag of like, I'm the villain. Ha ha ha. You just don't know. You just don't know exactly why or what I'm up to. He's obviously not trying to help the situation. So it's pretty obvious that he's got a lot more going on. You know, so once you have, like, all these puzzle pieces, like, the table is set and the movie can can proceed, you know, all the pieces are put into play against each other. I mean, it plays out pretty standard-wise. There's not a huge amount of surprises along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I only had one uh, quibble that I wanted to talk about about like just this overall structure of the movie was uh, uh, when Bourne visits Jarda in Munich and Jarda is the uh, the last remaining Treadstone agent other than Jason Bourne apparently or at uh-huh. least that's or at least that's what he says who knows mm-hmm. if, who knows if we can trust him on that right but uh, I cannot find any reason for uh Jason to have visited Jarda at that part of the film. Uh, one thing that did bug me is like Jarda realized at one point that he wasn't there to kill him. So why did he try and kill Bourne? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Where, I don't well, that's, know. A, that's a good that's a good point, which I had not considered, except that that's just I don't know what these Treadstone guys are tra- built to do. Clearly you know, I don't know. I think we all agree that the scene kind of was weird. But this this actually was my number three best trade craft because uh, um, I, I like the toaster. After their fight and Bourne kills Jarda, uh, Bourne basically breaks open, I guess, the gas tank or I guess like the hot water heater. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And has gas coming out. Then he rolls up a magazine and puts it in the toaster and hits the toaster, which would obviously set fire to the magazine, igniting the hot water heater or gas tank or whatever, and blowing up the building. I don't know how realistic this is, but I thought it was kind of cool because he basically like set up a little timer. It was like a makeshift like timer. And that's one of the things that uh, you know we look to the Bourne films for is like uh, his his incredible. Uh, improvisation tactics of just yeah. using simple items of like whatever's available to him. It's a great counterpoint against uh, again like Bond, who like in this case like in the same situation Bond he would have like taken off his watch and set it on the counter and just punched in a couple numbers and that yeah. would have that would have <laughs> been like the super bomb. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But uh, Jason doesn't have those gadgets, and so he's always just got to make do with what he's got right uh, which is another just uh, incredibly appealing uh thing about the character and about the the films in general yeah yeah uh, yeah toaster explosion is is definitely dope i think we just want to run through the tradecraft you know do's and don'ts uh in order of of what we see in the film yeah absolutely all right so uh just from the drop, I want to give like just global spy plus spy points for not just this scene, but just the movie in general for the way that the CIA is demonstrated as being extremely competent and on point. I fucking love that about this movie. They never, you know, you, you like you were saying, like in a lot of movies, we uh, spy movies, we just get kind of glimpses of the adversary. We don't really get to see like the way that they're operating. This movie takes us right into it and uh-huh. shows that what Bourne is up against is right. is it's it's serious. There are people, there are teams. You're always complaining <laughs> about lone agents. How do you like this for a team operation, Dave? Oh, it was great. This is definitely up there with our uh, a most wanted man team, which we both like. We're like super giddy about on how I well love, they I operated. Love, I love that team too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, it was a 
it, 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 anytime you get a team together in a movie like this, it, it, I get really giddy. Like I'm like, ooh, the run, the running stuff. You, you don't, know? you don't, you don't like the the lone agent kind of kind of guy. <laughs> Never. Which I mean, Bourne is, but. But it's, it makes it's, sense. It right, makes it sense. makes a he, lot of sense. Yeah, it's not. He didn't choose to be alone against the world. Right, it was kind of just thrust onto him. But um, it's not even that. It just makes sense story wise. It also makes sense to like I guess his tra- like it's it's like your, your suspension of disbelief is a lot easier in the Bourne films than in a Bond film or a Mission Impossible film. Even though Mission Impossible, he does have a team. He, you know, he has a whole group of people working with him, but it's all about him and like how much of a badass he is, you know, like even though it's, it is how much of a badass Bourne is as a solo guy, he's still up against like real th- big threats versus like in the Bond films. It's like Bond by himself is so like overpowered and like Q's gadgets are always like way over pre-planned, like. Like somebody was writing the script, and I think we talked about this in From Rush with Love. Like every single gadget he got was specifically made for some specific moment in the movie. Yeah, you just wind, you just wind Bond up and point him in the direction of the of the plot. Yeah, and, and everything will be taken care of. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I I definitely dug this team quite a bit. You know, it's not just the CIA, but also their contacts and their allies and the way that anyone anywhere in the world can be quickly leveraged to get to a spot. It's it's portrayed like that this network is incredibly just thick and omnipresent, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, we'll get to this later. But, you know, it's so there uh-huh. always that, like, he knows, like, all he needs to do is just, you know – wave like just one little blip like just yeah. register in a hotel with the wrong passport and boom mm-hmm. there's hundreds of people you know that are coming after him he's up against the cia and all of their allies and contacts you know like in germany like cctv's pulled up all over the film you know they've got satellite images they have a whole team they have people on ground they have the local police and all that stuff but on top of that you got abbott and gretkov like who are both both Abbott's in the CIA and Grekov's like working with the uh you know Russian Secret Service and KGB type you know organization so like the real villains are these guys that are like very experienced and very well connected so it's like he's he's got these two giant like uh I I guess uh like forces coming against him that he's got to kind of stand up against. Right. I love the way you're putting that. It's not just that, you know, it's him against the villains. It's also like him against the machine. Yeah. The, mach- <laughs> the, mach- the, mach- the machine itself. It's amoral. It's right. not, it's not good or bad. It's right. not villainous. It's just powerful. You know, right, 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 right. Yeah. And he's got to swim. <laughs> he's got to swim through that in order to uh, achieve his objectives. So, yeah. Yep. Love that. Love that whole feel that just permeates this franchise so much. It feels to me like so much more like, you know, Spectre. Ooh, Spectre is like really kind of cool and creepy. But at the end of the day, they're Cobra, you know, (laughs) you know, they're, they're comic book and, and, and the Bourne movies make, the real, the real, like, New World Order, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, its own separate character in the film, almost. Yeah, like, it's a life of its own. And I, and I like that you pointed out that it's kind of amoral. It's, it's, it's mainly, like, just like a force that it's just, kinda, it's yeah doing what it was designed to do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. As the basic setup of the Born Supremacy movie, uh, it's not just Jason against some random enemy spies. He has to tackle the entire New World Order, right, Dave? Absolutely, and that's what really sets this series apart. Next week, we're going to go deeper into the tradecraft of each individual character in this film and see if we think their moves make actual sense or not. As always, the best way to make sure you don't miss out on that is to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Google, or your favorite podcast app. Also, you can find updates on our Facebook page or website, spieslikeus.net. 
And please, if you can help us out, give us some feedback by rating us and leaving comments. We're always trying to improve the show and your thoughts would be a big help. The preceding transmission sampled the songs Ice Cold by Audio Nautics, Enter the Party by Kevin McLeod, and sound effects from freesound.org. Attributions and links are found at spieslikeus.net. Editing by Todd Hostetler.